Hey everyone, Matt Brunig here. I wanted to do a video about the success sequence, which is the uh, sort of conservative answer to how to fight poverty. Um, the success sequence is highly misleading, what I call a data cutting game, which I'll show you a little bit more detail on in a minute. Um, but before we do that, let's just get into what it is. I'll show you some of the uh, conservatives that like to talk about it. Here's Ben Shapiro, of course. We'll start with him. He has a little YouTube short about it, so that's nice. Let's see what he has to say. So here are the three rules. You want to you wanna be rich in America? You want to do well in America? You want to put aside the whining about the system? Again, you point out to me an individual instance of racism, I will stand next to you and fight it. But if you want to whine about America, no good. Okay, here are the three rules that you need to fill as a person before you can start complaining about your life failures being the result of somebody else's actions. Number one, you need to finish high school. Number two, you need to get married before you have babies. Number three, you need to get a job. That's it. You do those things, you will not be permanently poor in the United States of America. Okay, so we have, uh, and, and it's not just him. Um, I've been writing about this for years and years. It is suffuse on the right. So if you just, even if you just go into YouTube here and search success sequence, look, we have the American Enterprise Institute, uh, the millennial sec success sequence in uh, 60 seconds, even though the video is actually eight, uh, 79 seconds, the Georgia Center for Opportunity, another right-wing thing, success sequence. They really, and you see this in the Ben Shapiro one, especially. They, <laughs> they have a, <laughs> they struggle to not uh, kind of uh, shade towards indicating that they're really trying to talk to black people about it, right? Because that that's really, even though obviously black people, because they're only thirteen percent of the population, they do not make up. Uh, you know, anywhere near the majority of poor people. That's that's nonetheless like, <laughs> so it's a lot of that. Um, here's another one, American Enterprise Institute, the Red Pill University. I don't really know um, what that is. Institute for Family Studies. There's a hundred of them. Institute for Family Studies, American Enterprise Institute. Even Dave Ramsey, I think, gets into this. I guess he's kind of conservative. He, he You know, he'll tell you how to save in your IRA and also give you a little bit of conservative advice, the John Locke Foundation. I mean, we could go on and on. And it's um, it's bullshit. The whole thing is bullshit. <clears throat> it's, but it's bullshit in an interesting way that is very, like, lucid. Like, you can very lucidly explain why it's bullshit. And I did this last year. I've done this probably five or six times, but this is my last piece I ever wrote on it. And, of course, every time I write on it, I get better. Um, so I'll, I'll just take you through this one. And then I want to, at the end of taking you through this, I want to show you some data I just pulled from, um, the current population survey using a new, uh, a data file that I'd never used before until like the last couple days. That's really cool. I'm not going to do like a data tutorial, but I'll, I'll show you something that's interesting that uh, is not contained in this piece, but will also drive home the point about, um, the, the bullshit involved in all this. Okay. So let's start here. What is the success sequence? The success sequence is presented as a series of steps individuals can take that will ensure they have a very low poverty rate. This is described this way. Um, I was talking about Brian Kaplan, who described it this way, but if you notice, uh, Ben Shapiro did as well. Finish high school, get a full-time job. Once you finish school, get married before you have children. Now, what's interesting, and I'm not going to go in it, into this too, in too much in this video because it might bog down a little bit, is <clears throat> a lot of people have written on the success sequence over the years, but they, they have, I'm a success sequence completist. I've read all of it, literally all of it. If you read paper to paper, the actual rules of the success sequence change a little bit. And it's always interesting to see how they change because usually the change tracks some kind of ideological view that the author has. So in this piece, I point out that if you notice these three uh, rules listed here, they don't say that you need to delay having children. But one of the most famous papers, Saul Hill and Haskins, um, the success sequence paper, they said you needed to delay children until you uh, uh, were 21 years old. Um, that's not in here. That's not in this paper, the Wang and Wilcox paper. That's not in now the popular representation of it. That thing has fallen out, I guess, in a lot of the presentations of it. Um, and, you know, that's weird. The other thing is, when you look at this literature, get a full-time job, right, is often not get a full-time job. And this also tracks with... Um, kind of the ideological preferences of the authors. So, for example, in this one, they call you a full-time worker, 
if you work 35 hours a week or 50 weeks a year, this is in the Wilcox and Wang um, uh, study, or you are married and watching kids, but married and watching kids is not, that is not full-time work. Like in the, you don't have a full-time job. I mean, don't get me wrong. Watching kids is, is a lot of work, but if you are watching kids, you don't get income, right? Um, and then, or three are in college, but co- that's not working either. You don't get income from being in college. In fact, college costs you money. <laughs> it makes you poorer, at least in the immediate sense. Um, but why is this in here? Because these authors like these things. They don't. They like stay-at-home parents. They like if you go to college. So they just say, we'll just call those people full-time workers. But they're not. They're not. In um, Saul Hill and Haskins, they'll call you a full-time worker uh, if someone in your household works sometimes. Um, there's a lot of funny, there are other elements of this as well. So if you divorce, you are not counted as being married anymore. Um, so in uh, a lot of these, especially in Sil- Saw Hill and Haskins, if you divorce, you're counted as no longer following the success sequence. But if you are widowed, if, if your spouse dies, they do count you as following the success sequence. But how, how is your spouse dying better than being divorced? If, you, if they die... They can't, you know, at least if you divorce, they could send you some money. You know, alimony, child support, if they die, that's a, that's a total loss. There's no way that's better uh, for, for reducing poverty to have your spouse die than to have your spouse divorce. Um, but, you know, they like widows, but they don't like uh, divorcees. So, like I said, I don't want to bog on this <clears throat> because we have more pressing, more statistical matters that are worth going into. So let me read you this section because this is one. This is the first key to understand just the tremendous bullshit that underlies this whole thing. Okay, if you're trying to understand where poverty comes from in a capitalist society, the success sequence is not going to help very much. This is because the success, success sequence analy- success sequence analyses all begin by excluding the vast majority of poor people in the country. Wilcox and Wong only look at one, a- one wave of individuals who are between the ages of 28 and 34, which obviously excludes the vast majority of the population as well as the vast majority of poor people. Now, you might give them a pass because of the data they are working with, but Saul Hill and Haskins, the other, these are like the OG success, pe- success sequence people, they use the current population uh, ASEC file, which provides a sample of the entire population. So they really could see where the poverty is coming from. But instead, they decide at the very beginning of their analysis to exclude from their consideration these three groups. One, families with elderly people in them. Two, families with disabled people in them. Three, families where every member is below the age of 25. Now, you haven't heard. I'm sure if you've heard of Ben Shapiro or Dave Ramsey or you've watched some video you, or Prager or whatever, you've never heard probably that they do this in this study. Before they do any of those numbers, where they're like, if you're married and you have a kid, and you do, before they do any of that, they knock out not just all the old people and the disabled people, but also all the people that live with them. And then also all you know, households that just have like young people below the age of 25 in them. Why are they doing this? The reason they do this is because old people don't work, disabled people don't work, and if you have a family where every member is below the age of 25, you probably got a lot of college students, right? You might talk about like a household that just has a bunch of college students in it, uh, you know, that have low. So, so they're basically like, let's get rid of the old people, the disabled people, and the students, right? Okay, that's weird. Um, many of them are poor. Maybe we should include them in our analysis. But what happens when you do this, okay? Now, um, in the 2019 ASEC, these exclusions remove... 117.8 million people, 36% of all people are removed from the population when you exclude these three groups. 36% of all people. But more importantly, these exclusions remove 38.5 million people who are poor based on their market income, meaning the income they get from working or that they get from owning things, right? Not including government benefits, right? Right. So these exclusions, if you knock these people out of your population, out of your sample, and just ignore them, act like they don't exist, 38.5 million people who are poor based on their market income just get vanished from the file. And that is 65% of all people who are poor based on market income. So the first thing they do, 
before they do the rest of their analysis is they exclude two-thirds of poor people based on market income, right? So if you just look at the distribution of, of paychecks and interests and rents and dividends, the stuff you get out of the market, if you just look at that and you say, where are the poor people, right? The first thing they do is they take two-thirds of those poor people defined that way and they just, pff, gone. Not, we're not talking about those people. Excluded from our analysis, okay? That seems suspicious to me. <laughs> But it also, I mean, if you want to illuminate the question of poverty, you can't ignore two-thirds of it. You just can't do that. That's obviously fucking ridiculous, right? Now, why do they do this? And I just got asked this question today, and I try to be a little bit charitable these days on these things, but there's no charitable explanation for this. They just basically struggle with the fact that this little simple this oversimplistic story about poverty they want to tell, where all you got to do is get a high school degree, get married, and then have a job. That doesn't fit with, for example, our massive retired population, right? Because the retired people don't work, yet elderly people have the lowest poverty rate of any age group, but they don't work. So what does that tell you? Kind of tells you that that's probably not necessary, right? Because they're not poor because they get social security benefits. But wait a minute, if the welfare state can keep them from poverty, maybe it could keep the rest of us from poverty. They don't want your mind going down that track. So let's just get rid of all the old people and all the people who live with them. And then for disabled people, that one would actually kind of fit what they want to do because disabled people, at least as they're defined here, are people who have work limitations and they want to emphasize the value of work. But we don't want to beat up on disabled people and say, ah, see, you didn't follow the success <laughs> sequence because you fucking can't work because you have a serious physical or mental disability. We're, we're too sympathetic to that group. So uh, instead of counting them and saying, well, should be working, even though you can't, let's just ignore them. Let's just ignore them. I don't know. And then, of course, for students. Um, so that, that's step number one. <clears throat> the second thing is the success sequence is not a sequence, right? They present it as like a, a step, like a little thing you can uh, check off a checklist, right? Number one, graduate high school. You check it off. Number two, uh, get a full-time job. You check that off. Number three, get married before you have children. You check that off. So you, you check off the boxes and you're good to go. And there's some people that check off all the boxes and some people who don't check them off, and we just kind of follow in those people. But as I point here, this is presented as a sequence of steps that you can complete as if in a to-do list, and then be assured you aren't going to be in poverty. But finishing high school is the only step that you can actually cross off a list. The full-time job and marriage prongs are actually current statuses, not steps, right? So put more simply, if you graduate high school, you can never not you can never ungraduate high school. I mean, maybe there's some weird cases where they pull degrees or something, but like you graduate high school, that's it. They can't take that away from you. But you can lose a job. You can get divorced. All these things can hit you. You can become disabled. Obviously, we become elderly in our lives. There are things that can happen to you, right, that will knock you out of the success sequence, even though you've crossed all those things off the list, right? So they're not, it's not a sequence of steps. It's one step that you can cross off a list and then two current statuses that just describe what's your situation right now today, okay? So here's the problem with that. If someone who had otherwise been following the success sequence loses their job and falls into poverty as a result, this does not end up being counted as a success follower who fell into poverty. Instead, in both of these papers, this person's job loss makes them fail the work full-time rule and therefore moves them into the did not follow the success sequence bucket, which is then perversely used to prove how effective the success sequence is, right? So if you were following the success sequence, oh, I got married, I have a job and whatever, and then boom, you get laid off. Now you don't have a job and you fall into poverty. Now, if you're trying to be reasonable about this and thinking about, well, we're talking about life courses and life decisions and all this kind of stuff, you'd say, okay, well, there we go. The success sequence did not work for that person, right? They followed the success sequence and then they lost their job and they fell into poverty, right? That would be how most people would think about that. They'd say, mm, didn't work for that guy. Maybe it's a good idea overall, but for that guy, clearly it didn't work for him. He should be counted as a negative example 
of the success sequence not working. But that's not what they do. What they do is as soon as you lose your job, even though you got your high school degree, even though you got married before you had kids, even though you got a full-time job, as soon as you lose that job, they immediately move you over, move you out of the category of success sequence follower. They go, oh, you didn't follow the success sequence. They kick you out of the category. And then they go, and you're poor? See, (laughs) people don't follow the success sequence. They sure do become poor. It's like, No, I was following it and I lost my job. So clearly the success sequence did not protect me because the success sequence does not protect me from losing my job, something people do all the time, literally tens of millions of people a year. That's the like actual realistic way you you would talk about this with real people. But in their little data game where they cut the data and play around with it, right? All they do is they, they, they move you out of the bucket. They go, oh, you're not a success sequence follower anymore. And then they go, look, the only people who are still in the bucket, their poverty is still low. And it's like, well, yeah, no shit, because they're the people for whom they, their job, they haven't lost a job yet. <laughs> or people who their spouse hasn't died or they haven't hit a divorce or they haven't had to quit their job in order to take, take care of an ailing family member. All these things, these little events in our lives that often push people into poverty. As long as you ex- knock all those people out of the category of success sequence follower, even if they previously followed it, as long as as soon as they hit that bump in the road, you push them out of the bucket, you can be like, oh, success sequence, man, fucking undefeated, undefeated. But it's not undefeated. That's, that's misleading. So I conclude this here. <clears throat> Once you understand who the success sequence excludes from the analysis, elderly people, disabled people, and students, we discussed already, and how it reclassifies people when they hit an economic bunk, bump, whether job loss, death of spouse, divorce, leaving the workforce to care for a family member, it becomes clear that the success sequence is just a data-cutting game. It's not a serious effort to address the cause of and solution to poverty. I go on in this piece. I'll try not to spend too much time on this because I'd like to make this a shorter video, but you know, it's one thing for me to laugh at this success sequence bullshit. It's another thing to like, let's put forward an alternative explanation of, of where poverty comes from and, and how to stop it and all this kind of stuff, right? So poverty to me, not to me, in fucking reality is very simple, especially we're talking about a developed country has very high income, a lot, lot of money to go around. So how do some people wind up uh, poor or wind up with an income that, you know, we would see as below a, a reasonable standard of living in our society, given the living conditions that are, are possible. Okay. So <clears throat> it goes like this. In a capitalist society, the national income is distributed using factor payments, meaning payments to capital and labor. Capital income is extremely concentrated, right? The top 10% owns like 85% of the wealth or something like that. I did a video on that recently is extremely concentrated, so it's not a huge factor when it comes to keeping people out of poverty. Labor income is much less concentrated, but only half of the population receives labor income. The other half of the population, children, elderly people, disabled people, students, caregivers, and the unemployed do not work and therefore are almost entirely locked out of the direct distribution of income. Now notice this list here. These are people that they just, they exclude. They exclude elderly and disabled people from the analysis altogether for students and students, right? That's what they're doing with that below age 25 stuff. If you're a home caregiver, you're counted as not following success sequence. If you lose a job, you're counted as not following success sequence. So every time you find a, a person who is unable to work for one reason or another, they kick you out of the success sequence. And that makes sense in a like deceptive way, but half, that's half the population. Right at any given time, half the population is not working. And so what we see here, and this is a little graph I put together. So if we look at personal earnings by percentile, what you see is about 48% of people have no earnings at all. That's including kids and retired people and disabled people and whatever. And then here are the people who do earn, which is about half. So half, half work, half don't work. Half receive paychecks, half do not receive paychecks. And so... The basic problem of poverty is how do you get money from here to here? That's the basic problem of poverty. That's the, really the, that's it. That's the big challenge. And there's basically two approaches, right? So either you can combine people on the right side of that graph above into family units with people on the left side of the graph. So we see that obviously with parents and kids, but you could also see it living with an elderly adult or a disabled spouse or an unemployed, but whatever. 
Or we can use the welfare state to transfer money from the right side of the graph to the left side of the graph. Now, if you're talking about reducing poverty as a societal matter, then what you're going to want to do is use the welfare state. Um, I mean, you could try the family approach, right? But what you're, if you're going to try the family approach, the way you're going to have to do it is somehow line it up so that every family, as it says right here, every family has a one-to-one -one ratio of workers to non-workers, right? So two parents and two kids, that works, but like a disabled spouse needs to be with a working spouse, a, a, a retired person needs to be with a working, like somehow you got to get these family units set up so it's half and half right? Half working, half not working, because half the population doesn't work. And that's the only way you can get, you know, the incomes to spread. So these like big compounds, maybe, like I said here, with 10 workers and 10 non-workers, that would be the approach where you're like goofing around with the family structure. More realistically, that's not going to happen. Um, and so what we do with the welfare state is, as I say here, Rather than redistributing people across family units, the welfare state approach attacks the poverty problem by redistributing income across family units. By levying a tax on all workers in order to fund cash benefits for non-workers, old age pensions, disability benefits, child allowances, caregiver allowances, and unemployment benefits, the welfare state ensures that income from workers spread to non-workers regardless of the composition of each family unit. This approach effectively achieves the desired one-to-one -one worker to non-worker ratio across the entire society, and if sufficiently comprehensive and generous, brings poverty down to a very low level. That's, that's how you do it. You got to account for the fact that capitalism gives no income to about half the population, and you got to figure out how to get income to them. And you can kind of rely on the family a little bit, but as we see in this graph, it's not like every family unit has half the people working, half the people not working. Right, some of them, about 20% of them, 100% of the people in the family are working. Right, think about uh, a single adult, you know, living alone who works full time, or, or dual income, no kids, the dinks and whatever. And then we got about, you know, almost 20% who don't work at all. This is especially going to be like retired couples. In the middle here, it's about 50/50. We got about 20% who really do have the 50/50, but then we've got another. 30% here who are less than 50% of their family is working. And then another, you know, 30, 20% here where a little bit more than half are working, right? So we have this unbalanced uh, distribution of non-workers across families and the welfare state is able to fix that, right? Because it taxes all of the workers here, right? And then it moves the money over here. Simple. Now, if you want to talk about an individual strategy, because that's what they're talking about, they want to individualize it. Well, if you want to individualize your poverty strategy, the answer is very obvious. Maximize the number of workers who are in your family unit and minimize the number of non-workers in your family unit. It's as simple as that, right? Don't live with an unemployed person. Don't live with a disabled person. Don't live with an elderly person. Certainly don't have kids. There's no, that's one of the funny things I, I, I love about the success sequence is like get married before you have kids. Kids never improve your poverty situation. <laughs> they always bring your situation down economically without the welfare state. Now, the welfare state can come in and take care of the child care, take, give you a child allowance, do all that, right? With a welfare state, it can offset the cost of a children by, by socializing it throughout the economy. Um, but if you don't have that, the rule should be don't have kids, right? Don't have, period, right? But they don't want to do that because they're conservatives and they're feds. So, so that, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's kind of funny, right? They, they depart from what the obvious wisdom would be there um, for ideological reasons because they're not really focused on poverty. They're focused on creating this kind of ad hoc uh, little sequence um, that they can use to blame people, um, but yeah, that's the basic gist of it. Um, what is the other thing? Oh, oh, the other thing I wanted to point out here, look at these rules here. Finish high school, get a full-time job. Once you finish high school, get married before you have children. It was only like in 1970 or something thereabouts uh, when half the population had a high school degree or not. Like this is one of the funny things always. <laughs> it's like, this is a time in memorial. Everyone has known this. It's like, Almost nobody who has ever lived has finished high school. And then the ones that say you need to wait until you're 21 or 25 or whatever to have kids, people used to have kids when they were fucking 20, you know, 18. <laughs> like, you know. And what's funny is this, this thing will change over time, right? So like, you know, I, 10, 15 years from now, it's going to be get a college degree, 
it's you know like wait until you're 30 to have kids like they change the sequence so that's always kind of moving but anyways one other thing i wanted to do on this so recently i've i've and this is not that recent though it's the first time i've used it so if you go to IPUM CPS, not IPUMS USA, but IPUM CPS, CPS stands for Current Population Survey. They have these, um, this is where the Current Population Survey, by the way, at least the, um, the, the ASEC files, that's where all the poverty data comes from. That's where they calculate all of this stuff, right? So when, when Sawhill and Haskins are writing their paper, they're using this data, okay? And... <clears throat> One of the interesting things about the current population survey is about a fourth of the sample is sampled, will show up in, in two consecutive years, right? So another way to put it is this. It's a monthly survey, and they put out monthly stuff, but once a year they ask these big questions about poverty and income and government benefits and all this kind of stuff. And in the monthly survey, the way it works is when you get surveyed, when you get brought into the survey, I think they survey 60,000 households a month, you are in this, they survey you every month for four straight months. And then you drop out of the survey for eight months, and then they survey you again for the next four months, right? So you end up having four months, eight months off, four months on. And what that means, therefore, is that in March, when they ask these questions that are related to poverty and income and health insurance and whatever, if you can if you can follow the survey respondents over time you can get people who exist in both years right so you can get people who were surveyed in march of 2018 and march of 2019 the same person and so now you don't have to just focus on one year you don't have to just say i want to look just at one point in time i'd like to look at two points in time and what's cool about looking at two points in time is you can see what has changed between these two points in time. And so I do that here. And they, they, they made this very easy with iPums. You were able to do this for a long time, but it was, it was difficult because you had to download multiple files. You had to match people across files, and matching was not always straightforward. So they made it really easy here. And you can download a file that has both years in it, and it only has the <clears throat> it only has the people who are in both years and they're linked and it's it's great. Um, so what I wanted to do with this, you can uh, see my stuff here. This is what I downloaded. Um, as far as variables are concerned, I'm not going to walk you through everything, but here's you know here's my code and you know what I wanted to see is let's look at the people that they say followed the success sequence in a given year like 2018, right? And let's see how many of them would be counted as also following the success sequence in the next year, right? Because we always get these point-in-time measures. We just say 2018, and you go, oh, this many people follow the success sequence, and here's their poverty rate and all this kind of stuff. But as I point out here, the success sequence, it's not something you just check off you know, some boxes on a list and you're done. If you lose your job, you're no longer a success sequence follower. If you get divorced, you're no longer a success sequence follower. If you become disabled, they just kick you out of the analysis altogether, blah, 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 right, on and on. So instead of doing one point in time, let's take all the people who follow the success sequence in one year, right, who would be categorized that way, and then let's see where they would be categorized in year number two. Let's follow them and see what happens. So I did that today. It took me a long time because <laughs> I've never done this before. Uh, it's quite a, you know, two years and, you know, it was complicated. It was a lot easier than it used to be, but um, complicated. So I come up with this. <clears throat> First off, I guess I should take you to here. Now let's just stick here, right? And this is the easiest way to do it. Okay, so if you isolate only the people who, who were classified as following the success sequence in 2018... And then you go, where were they in 2019? Here's what you get. 81.5% are still classified as following the success sequence. 8.4% end up falling out of the universe, which means that they either become disabled or someone they live with became disabled or they become elderly or someone they live with became elderly or maybe they added a disabled or elderly person to their household, right? Um, so they would fall out of the universe, meaning they don't get counted as, as, at all. It's not that they're counted as people who don't follow the success sequence. They're just ignored. Like we talked about before, they ignore two-thirds of poor people right out the gate. So they end up falling out of the universe. 
And then another 10%, they stay in the universe, but now they get reclassified as not following the, uh, the success sequence anymore, either because they lost a job or they became divorced or, or, or whatever, right? Or had a child out of wedlock, who knows? So in one year, in one year, just one year, one in five people who they would say, oh, that person followed the success sequence gets kicked out. They're no longer in the success sequence. That's in one year. Over the course of three, four, five years, the percentage of people that are going to get categorized as following the success sequence across all of those years is going to be quite low. Like it might even be less than 50%. And all this is just to kind of emphasize again that this is just a data cutting game, right? Because as soon as these people hit some kind of bump in the road, whether disability, old age, or whatever, job loss, or whatever, they just get kicked out of the sequence. So it's not a kind of thing where you go, oh, we have this population of success sequence followers and this population of non-success sequence followers. It's the same population, just in different years. And in the years where they're doing bad, they just go, oh, you didn't follow the success sequence, that's why you're poor. And then when the years when they're doing good, they go, Oh, that's because you follow the success sequence. But it's the same person just in different years. There's no, we're not tracking someone like in a real like, oh, he made good decisions when he was 25 and that really, that's not what they're doing at all. And this shit, you know, I'm getting a little bit animated even though it's one o'clock at night in the morning, but <clears throat> it annoys me because poverty is such a simple thing. It's such an easy thing to solve. And clearly this whole thing is just motivated, not by any kind of sincere desire to understand poverty, but to be able to say, the people who are poor, it's, it's their fault. It's because they didn't follow the success sequence. They're degenerate um, and stop complaining and you have full control over this. And it's not true, right? The things that cause poverty in a society like ours is something that can hit anyone. Any one of us can lose a job. I've been fired before. I lost a job. I was unemployed for like two or three months. You know, I mean, I don't know. Was that my fault? Maybe a little bit. <laughs> but, you know, 40 million people a year get dislocated from their prior job. You know, over the course of, over the course of a career, people move jobs 10 plus times. People become unemployed many, many times. You know, that's the nature of the beast. Disability could hit any of us. Disability hits a lot of us at some point, especially as we get older. We all become old one day. We, any one of us could have a disabled kid. I know someone who had a very severely disabled child. She had to quit her job, take care of them. Did she not follow the success sequence? I mean, we really, yep, there you go. That's why you're not doing well. You didn't follow the success sequence. I had a disabled child. Yeah, but you're not working full time now. So, well, but I was. Yep, not anymore. So you're off. So, so success sequence undefeated. It's fucking stupid. It's cruel. It doesn't help you understand poverty. And the dumbest people in the world get into it. Here, I guess I should move this over. <laughs> My head was blocking it the whole time. Here you see 80%, 8.4%, 10.1%. You know. Anyways, let me know uh, what you think. Uh, I'm going to do some more videos soon. <clears throat> I just got over the monetization threshold. Thank you. It took me like 40 days. I made $11 in the last few days. So <laughs> uh, thanks for watching. Subscribe, share, do all that stuff. And uh, I'll, I'll have a few more videos this week.